I am at Towny Meeting 2019 with Mark Battiato. Yes. Did perfecto, I say it right? Perfecto. Perfecto. <laughs> and uh, my gosh, is that a, is any chance that's Italian? A little bit. A little bit. But my the mom always reminded me that I have French and Swiss uh, Canadian in me as well. So Fr French <laughs> and Canadian and Canadian, <laughs> French Canadian, Quebec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that is a um, that is a uh, Sicilian. Sicilian. And I was looking at a map the other day. Of, it was a map of Italy. I think it was the year 1500 or 1600. Sicily was more than half of Italy at that time. Wow. I mean, Sicily went all the way up to Roma. Yeah. And when you're um, our generation, you think Sicily is a little island. What do you mean, our generation? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you, you, right now, Sicily's just this little oh, island. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it used to be half of Italy. I haven't gotten there yet. That's my on my bucket list I need yeah. to get there. My personal assistant is Sicilian. Oh, nice. And her mother... Um, that she sees very dedicated and loyal. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, so we have a long um, history together here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, yep. Mike Schuster a legend in dentistry forever. <laughs> yeah. um, when I was at Creighton and dental school, my assistant worked for him for six, seven years. And then when I, I graduated and moved out to Phoenix, my assistant Jan had worked for Mike Schuster for the whole time I was in college. We were yeah. the same age. Yep. And so for 30 years, I got to hear, that's not how Mike Schuster did it. <laughs> or I would tell her something, that's not what Mike Schuster said. And I remember the first couple of years out of school, I'm like, uh, who is this Schuster guy? And right, but I, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I owe so much to Mike Schuster. So do I. Because exactly. he, he, and you married his daughter. Married one of his daughters. Yes, one four. Of, you didn't marry all four? <laughs> no, I don't think they'd do, want me. Do they have laws against that or something? Uh, so, um, so talk about your journey. How did so? Did you start with uh, your journey in dentistry? Start with Mike Schuster's daughter. Is that, is, was that <laughs> yes, great direction in dentistry? I actually met her at the uh, Arizona Marathon race. This is twenty five years ago. She was. Uh, I had a booth there, like here, and uh, I was promoting this health product and uh, I did the relay she Christy my wife did the marathon and after the race uh, Christy's mother mother was there Joanne and she saw me behind the booth so she said I'm gonna fix up Christy because she was on the rebound I was a rebound guy because Christy just broke up with this or this guy broke up with her so as her mother was like I'll try to find someone else and I was the, the rebound and so Christy came over and she was Beautiful, and most important thing I noticed was her tights, and that was it. And a year later, we got married, and I was working at uh, 3M Company. Prior to that, I went to ASU, graduated with a marketing degree, which didn't mean anything because all the books now, are, everything they looked, I taught, I got learned in marketing doesn't, they don't even teach it anymore. And uh, I started my own company, and I was like the E myth. Within five years, my company failed, and I owed everybody. I remember I called my dad in Chicago, that's where I grew up, and uh, my dad was a CPA, and I said, Dad, can you help me file chapter 7, 11, and 13? I knew the numbers, but I didn't know what they meant. And I remember there was a pause, and uh, he said, Mark, I'm not going to help you file any of those. You have to pay back everybody, and you need to pay back the $25,000 that you, my mom, your mother and I lent you. And he didn't say it mean, because my dad... Uh, surprisingly, my dad was Italian, but he, he, I never heard him yell growing up. And I found out later the reason why. But uh, it took me about seven years to pay all that $80,000 back. I remember going to consumer credit counseling here in Eric Phoenix. Uh, that was like the lowest point in my life because I couldn't pay my bills and all these creditors were calling me. And, and, uh, and then luckily, I was about a week moving back probably a couple of weeks say, calling my parents and say, can I move back home in Chicago? And that would have been the lowest thing for me to move back home. Now it's like, can I stay with you forever? <laughs> you know, kids, my kids are still with me in their twenties. <laughs> but I got a call from 3M and a year later out of the blue and they said, hey, we have an office here in Scott in Scottsdale. Would you want to come in for an interview? And I remember after that call, I actually cried actually uh, because I was so desperate and I didn't have any money. I was living hand to mouth and I, I asked God, I said, could you help me on the interview because I'm a wreck. And I remember going to an interview and the second interview, there 80 people were interviewing for one position 
and uh, the district manager flew in from Chicago. So I kind of, we kind of hit it off a little bit, but he was like, man, you're all, all over the map, Mark. You have five different jobs in the last three years. Why would we hire you? Because we're gonna invest a lot of money in you and you're probably gonna leave in a year. And I didn't know what I was gonna say. I mean, I just, I just looked at him and said, hey, Gene, his name is Gene. I said, uh, well, I guess you could look at it that way, but I, I look at it like I've been in five different companies. I got to know a lot of different people, met different personality types, and I, now I can relate to anybody. And he kind of looked at me and he goes, hmm, that's an interesting answer. <laughs> and uh, three days later, I got a call and I got hired. And so I was able to pay back all my debt because 3M paid for education and company car. And, and then uh, I met my, my, uh, my wife, Christy, at the marathon race, and then my father-in-law, Michael Schuster, you know, had the Center for Professional Development here. So you started a company and it failed. What was yeah. the company that failed? Health Concepts of America. It was a direct sales marketing company that uh, we went, I actually hired people, wouldn't work today, to go door to door. We uh, worked with health clubs and we took the, we, we actually signed people up in their homes in the membership. So, and an introductory membership, so we, so that way they'd go to the club and get signed up for a longer term. So I had 70 people working for me, three offices in Atlanta at one time, and I didn't know we'd, we'd uh, saturate the market so quickly. So within six months, everything collapsed and I owed everybody. And so anyway, it all happened for a reason. And so then when you were hired by 3M, they have like eight divisions. One of them includes dentistry. Was it the dental division? No, actually back then they had out, the outdoor advertising. They had billboards at one time. 3M owned billboards all across the country. Really? So I got the, it was very fascinating to learn about all the advertising vehicles, radio, newspaper. So then you worked for 3M. For five years, you, yeah. Five years, then you married Schuster. Then I met her at the marathon race, and then uh, I actually asked to be interviewed at the center, but I never got a call. The center? The, my father-in-law's company. Right, well, t tell them the name of it. It was called the Center for Professional, Professional Development, Development back then. In, in Scottsdale. Scottsdale. Which he, was, which he ran for what, 50 years? He started in, I think it's 1976, and uh, he just retired last year. Uh, so is the center still, he just retired. Yeah, he, he sold sell, it to another doctor, I believe. Yeah. For, for the dental office or for the education? For the education. So I don't, I don't know what's going on with that. I, but uh, I resigned, I worked there for eight years and then my partner Deb Castile worked there at the center. And so, so when Mike, I resigned- So Mike yeah. Schuster sold the Center for Professional Development to another yeah. guy. Yes. A dentist? Last, yes, last year. But and you, don't know his, you don't know his name? Yes, it's uh, Mike. Uh, time drop. Mike Edwards. Mike Michael Edwards. Edwards. Yeah. And then you and your wife, um, Schuster's daughter, Christy. Yes. Started a company called the Gig. Well, Launch I started that company with uh, Deb Castillo, Growth and the Greatness Institute. I got that name from um, a mentor of mine named Bill Bailey. He always coined the term growth. And that's a big shout out to Deb Castillo. That was actually my classmate at UMKC Dental School, who's a dentist oh, okay. in um, Albuquerque oh, okay. in New Mexico. Yeah. But uh, this isn't that Deb Castillo. So no. we're learning today there are two Deb Castillo. We just talked to him. We just had a conference call this morning at 6.50 in the morning with a Albuquerque dentist, Gary Sanchez who you would love to interview. He, he uh, has the Y Institute. He took Simon Sinek's book and spent the last 10 years how to integrate that into your life. Is the he a y. dentist? Yeah, he's a dentist and he's worked with Fortune 500 companies now. He speaks all over. Oh my God. Gary Sanchez, his brother, him, are dentists in Albuquerque. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Well, will you uh, email us oh, both? Yeah, yeah. My email, by the way, is howard at dentaltown.com. Um, so, so then um, when Mike sold, so when did you start the I, growth? I, into uh, Greatness Institute. You, what do you call it? The Gig Institute? Great, it, the website is greatnessinstitute.com. We started it 20 years ago, and we have a team of people. We only work with 12 practices a year. The reason why is when we first started, I kind of took the model my father-in-law had where group, group trainings, fly people in with their teams and go through a one-year entrepreneurial process of systems, organizational development, health center, dentistry, overhead control, profitability versus production. That was the whole thing with my father-in-law was all profitability based. That's why I, I still don't like a lot of consulting today because it's still production, production, production. But his model was profitability, health centered, and then my partner worked in the support department, Deb, and so we started 20 years ago. And after 9-11 happened, 
we were doing group trainings in Seattle and Oregon because I moved to Oregon, Medford, Oregon for 17 years. And uh, when 9-11 hit, there was a doctor in Ohio who said, Mark, I'll get on a plane, but my, my team's not getting on a, on a plane. And I'm like, okay, I understand. I was stranded for three days. And uh, he said, would you come and do the training just with our team? We've never done that before one-on-one. -on -one. I called Deb and she said she'd go. Well, after four days with that one team, Deb called me and uh, she said, Mark, I'm not doing group trainings anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, she goes, I got done in four days with this one team that it takes six months with group trainings. And I'm like, well, Deb, that's how we make our money. We make more money when we do group trainings. And she goes, I don't care. I'm not doing it anymore. And I'm like, okay. It took us two years to get off group trainings. And now we just do one-on-one -on -one individualized uh, coaching and we just brought a dentist, a full-time dentist, Dr. Kevin Kowishan on our team who you interviewed a few months ago and he taught at Spear and he's been fabulous. So now we have a doctor that works with the back office and we have Deb that works with the front office. You know, systems, organizational development, how to stay in a health-centered practice model. So that's been pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Well, and um, so you only do 12 practices a year. Yeah. Do you onboard like one new office each month or 12 months of the year? Or do you well, onboard we, them yeah. all? We, we finally, about three years ago, we finally, it took us so long to try to get to this point, but we work with about the first of the year, we work with eight practices up till May. And then we take on two or three after September, October, so right then, because then we go back to those practices again in the summer. So we want to, we spend so much time with these practices that we, if we took more, we couldn't serve them. And, right. Uh, so it's not a game of volume with you. No. It, and that's, that's the key to our work. And I, people have asked us to, to take on more clients and it, it, we're just not going to do it. So how much money does this cost to, to do it? <laughs> I mean, it's Dennis Dr. Pinky say, don't quote a fee before an unsold case. So I think, I mean, it's not like I couldn't, well, every practice is a little different because if they have a partner or, or multiple practices and the fee's a little bit different, but we do have a 14 month program. And we, do, we our philosophy has been for a long time, after 14 months, we don't want you paying us anymore. We, I, I know consultants that charge people 2,000, 1,500, 3,000 a month for years. And I'm like, we're like, why do you have to keep paying this consultant? You should own it. And our whole philosophy has been like, we want to give you the whole flywheel, all the systems, monitor, get a new playbook in place, have everything documented, have your team understand what overhead percentages are, understand profitability. And by the end of 14 months, it's, you own it. We stand behind our fee, whatever it is, and we'll stick with it until we get it back. But it's, uh, you know, we, we're pretty good at getting results and uh, indoctrinating you know the the model and the systems in place and okay uh, and the website is i just had it i don't know why it didn't show up in my recent searches uh www dot greatness institute dot com just one word greatness institute dot com yeah and there's and there's some interviews on there some information dr koishan's on there my partner dev uh some of the doctors we've worked with uh what our process is and if someone's really interested, Howard, I mean, because we only work with 12 a year, um, I'm the one that would go out and do a business financial analysis and that doesn't commit the doctor to work with us. Uh, we have a fee of $1,500 for that, but I waive that fee and I just say, look, if you want me to come out and spend five hours with you, just pay for my travel. We'll look at all your numbers. I'll get your profit and loss statement. I'll do a full exam, diagnosis like you do with a patient. Look in your mouth. Look in the practice. Look at everything that's going on in the hygiene department. And then give you a whole report. And then from there, we can say, okay, it's like a SWOT analysis. And then from there, we can look at, okay, here's your opportunities, threats, possibilities. Here's what we think we can do based on the wherever you're at in your career. Some down, Deb and Kevin are going out to Florida next week to work with a doctor who's 65. That's a totally different plan than a young doctor. We're just starting, uh, you know, that's just trying to get onboard new team members. So every every doctor is a little bit different. We work with specialists. Um, I'd say perio and oral surgery. We about 70 percent or 30 percent out of the 12, about two or three years specialists. The rest are general restorative dentists, mostly solo some partnerships but yeah it's a pretty comprehensive it's a holistic model that we learned from my father-in-law uh we you know over 20 years we've tweaked our own uh 
processes into it, but it's very holistic. It engages the whole team and it gets them to think entrepreneurial with the doctor. Just like some of the stuff you were talking about yesterday in your intro, you know, the team understanding, you know, how many calls are coming in, how tracking and analytics are all critical that the team understands how the analytics and the numbers play a role, what measures gets done, like you said. And, uh, you know. Well, I'm, I'm a huge, huge um, supporter of dental practice consultants because I see all these dentists jumping around into starting to place implants or CAD cam or you know these occlusion cam all these different things and their house isn't in order they, they they don't they don't i mean they do a dollars with a dentistry they don't even know if they made a dime they don't know if they made the dime after tax they you know i always say get poised for growth and you got to get your business i'm a dentist but I have an MBA and I look at um, my career, you know, I, I practiced dentistry 10 years before I got my MBA and that was the inflection point. Once I got my MBA, I understood everything, it just, just skyrocketed. But on his website, the greatnessinstitute.com, greatnessinstitute.com, um, he says, um, Growth into Greatness Institute Philosophy centers on seven strategies for practice development and personal growth. Number one, a consistent plan for setting, rearranging, evaluating, strengthening the purpose of your goals. Number two, a detailed management plan for present resources. Three, a detailed plan for the use of your time. Four, a consistent plan for the gathering of knowledge. Five, a consistent association with people who have a common interest in progress, success, ideas, and philosophy. Six, a consistent plan for developing all your skills. Seven, lifestyle, a consistent plan for figuring ways to live uniquely, how to be happy with what you have while pursuing what you want. But in my 31 years, everybody that I thought built a successful office and by success i mean they were happy they weren't burned out they they were meeting their goals they they their their expectations from going into this profession were met it's not a question if they use a consultant it's like which three did you use or which four did you use i mean even my friends that are 60 are saying you know they're saying well who do you recommend for consultant i'll say i'll give them like three names say, oh i use all three of those I'm, we're, you know so yeah. so it's a lifelong journey of trying yeah, to get exactly. their house in order yeah, and it's interesting you say that because yesterday i had a dentist come up to me and young dentist and i won't say who he is but he he's buying two practices and it's like that's a lot and he's like and he was asking me what we did and he goes well i might try to do it on my own and uh i just kind of smile inside a little bit and i just said you know my father-in-law was 30 he had a heart attack he thought it was a heart attack in dubuque iowa it was an ulcer and he, he said, I can't keep practicing. He'd look at his, his schedule on Sunday night, get sick to his stomach, how he had a run and gun. And, and he, that's when he decided uh, to go to Panky Institute and get the cross of life and try to figure out a different way. But uh, I said to him, you know, my father-in-law at age 31 hired these consultants out of Canada called Cox, C-O-X. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Flight Manual to Success, something like that. Uh, and he worked with them for seven years. And I said, you know what he paid back in the 70s? $30,000 a year back then for consultants. I said, that's a lot of money today still. And I said, but by the time he was 40, guess what? He was a millionaire, yeah. you know, because he got good mentoring, good coaching. And my, my me other mentor, Bill Bailey, said the greatest discovery he made in his life when he, when he was 44 is that he could ask for help. He said, Mark, the greatest thing you can do is ask other people for help. He goes, when I did that, finally my life changed. He said, it took me five years to feel okay without asking help internally, but ask for help. You know, you gotta get the good, the right mentors, right? You gotta get the right people because there's there's not there's a lot of coaches just like in in our field dental consulting they're they're not they're not the best they're not there's a lot of dentists who aren't great dentists well find the good ones like Jim Rohn my mentor said read books take courses hang around five people who know more than you like on my team all those people they know way more than me <laughs> yeah and I want to congratulate you um, for listening to this podcast because you know all readers or leaders that was my generation when you can only find this stuff on books now you can find great information on podcasts online yeah. CEs, things yeah. like that but you're listening to a dental podcast as opposed to 
seeing what Kim Kardashian's wearing on TMZ or, you know, something like that. <laughs> and and what the other thing you said is so important is, you know, you're a summation of your five best friends. So in your, you know, that's in yeah. your family, but in your profession, yeah. don't hang out with four people that are telling yeah. you that dentistry's stupid and the golden yeah, yeah. years are over. They're just going to drag you down the mud. There's, there's 10,000 dentists in America that love it, yeah. making bank, exactly. doing exactly. great work you know, all that kind of stuff. So you consider yourself a, um, a, you say a business life coach. Right. And then your partner, Deb Castillo, um, she's the director of training. So yes. what do you do? What does Deb do? What does Kevin do? I mean, you got all these yeah. people on team. Let, let's just go all down the, the list. Doctors, so so yeah. what do you do? Well, my role is pretty similar to what I did with my father-in-law, Dr. Schuster, at the business school, is I would go out. So he's your father-in-law. Do you still have to call him Dr. Schuster? <laughs> what, what do you call him when you're drinking he's beer? He's coming over Sunday. Uh, he, I, I'll, I'll, call, I'll give him a hug and call him Mike. You call him Mike. Well, give him a hug from me. <laughs> I will. I'm going to tell him. him thanks for training my assistant, Jan, <laughs> yeah, exactly. for, for seven years. I can not like Mike. <laughs> and, uh, no, but be I, like Mike. <laughs> we, had, we had Mike on the show. Uh, oh, yeah. Amazing. But, but, um, no, if it wasn't for Mike, I wouldn't be, my father-in-law wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I'm totally blessed. He's a mentor, a guide. He pushed me. Matter of fact, I remember the first week, uh, I don't know exactly the words, but the first week I was at the, he gave me three books to read, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, Entrepreneurial Myth, The Seven Habits, Highly Effective People, and The Richest Man in Babylon. And I remember like five- Who wrote The Richest Man in Babylon? Uh, Richard Clausen, okay. uh, classic book. Right. Um, but uh, after the first four, day, five days I was there, he came to my cubicle and he goes, hey, how's it going on that E-Myth book, Mark? And I wasn't a reader back then. I didn't. I didn't like to read. And I, I'm like, well, I'm on like I'm on chapter three, I guess. And he's like, what the hell, man? He goes, you need to read this book. That's why your business failed. <laughs> you know, you need to understand what happened. You know. And I'm like, chill out, man. And he's like, okay. You know. But then when I read that book, I realized, wow, I, I didn't have systems. I was good at the entrepreneurial role, you know, the visionary, but I didn't have management systems, organization, and. And the truth is most of us are only one out of those roles, right? So we got to bring other people in to help us. It's just like you said earlier, good to great, you know, and that book, good to great, Jim Collins, tech, technology wasn't the thing that got most of the companies from good to great. It was their leadership, level five leadership and all that. So. I know and Dennis always think it's technology, like you would never be sitting at a table with physicians and they'd be bragging or advertising about what kind of MRI machines are, right. are exactly. ultrasound machines. That's the the dentists think it's, it's the physicians yeah. never talk yeah. about technology ever, ever, yeah. ever, ever. Dentists are obsessed with it. But, but, we, but podcasting is a youth behavior. So a quarter, send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com. Just tell me how old you are, what country you're from. A quarter of them are still in dental school. All the rest are under 30. I get like well, one old guy a week that says I'm as old as you. said yesterday in your introductory speech I never heard before. Or I, I, sim, I heard similar, but it really, I think it inspired me a little bit when you said, because now they're getting out of school. I think you said, I, I actually took notes on your meeting. 273,000 or something like that, dental yeah. school debt. And, but you compared it to like, that's, don't get freaked out because kids are going to cost you 270. One kid is going to, and I know that, you know, yeah. and two kids and said, you know, and then the other thing you said is, cause I had a doctor come up to me at the booth and said, well, Howard said that, uh, if you don't work with a consultant, you'll make about 70, 780,000 a year production. But if you do, you will make about 1.2. Right. And he, he was kind of questioning whether that was true or not. And I said, well, it's probably, I've never heard that before actually, but I said, I, that's the first time I heard that, but I like it. Yeah, every <laughs> no. every dentist that I talk to that's working with a consultant collects about one point two million, and every dentist that's never used a consultant collects about seven eighty. But you and, know what's interesting and about that, that data is widespread because available. we've Deb, Deb has kept data for nineteen years, and the average practice when they start with us is doing six ninety production. We get them up to eight twenty, and their overhead is sixty five point eight percent. And then we get them down to 57. We have about an 8.48 reduction in overhead. So, uh, and it doesn't matter where they start. This is another thing that consultants won't tell you. After 20 years of doing this, no matter where they start, sort of scratch start, the highest doctor we had producing a solo was 2.3 in Fresno. Uh, great dentist, a Koi's dentist. Uh, but uh, we got about 158,000 
or 138,000 right around their production increase, no matter where they started, whether they were scratch yeah. or, so it was not, that wasn't the key. It was efficiency, overhead, and here's profitability. The, and here's the other thing that they, they, their brain cannot accept this information is that those successful dentists, so many of them, don't place implants, don't do Invisalign, don't do SnoreGuard. Yeah. They just, it's just a bread yeah. and butter practice. Exactly. They'll do like, you know, just yeah. crown and bridge fillings, a recall, a simple endo, yeah. and they're doing 1.2, they're taking yeah. home 350 a year, and then the yeah. guy doing 780 thinks, well, I could never do that unless I had sleep apnea and placed implants and did sinus lifts and, and those are all separate. It, it's kind of like a restaurant. Imagine you had an Italian restaurant and it was going south and you thought the only thing that would save it was to add beef stroganoff. How many Italian restaurants were saved by adding the German dish beef stroganoff? No, they, they if you can't make money in an Italian restaurant, something's wrong with your business. But and you know what? I did go to uh, in, in Sacramento, in Galt, California. I was there two weeks ago with a dentist and he took me to a Mexican restaurant that had Italian food. <laughs> and it was actually pretty good. You know, I was shocked, but, uh, but my father-in-law, you know, I, le I went to all his lectures for eight years around the country and he said this, you know, this line is always the same. He said, look, would you rather have a, a million dollar practice at a 70% overhead? You've heard this or a 500,000 or 50% overhead. You make more money at a, at a five and you're not killing yourself. You have a life. You can have time with your kids in the summer, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. And, it, and it's tough. I mean, I'm 56, you know, I worked two days last week and when you sit down and a patient has, needs an MOD composite on two, three, four, five, that's work guys. There's no shortcuts. I just you, turned you 58. Did you? Yeah, come you, on, look you, at this, you come on, who's younger? <laughs> you can't do, I mean, there's just no getting around. It, it, it's like, I mean, it, 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 that's a lot of work. So the, what he just said was, would you rather sit down that hour and do four MOD composites or would you rather sit down and do two? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd rather do two. So let me get back to your question because you and I can, we, we can go all over the map, but you said, what do I do, Deb and Kevin? Yeah. So my role is if a doctor's interested, they hear about us, I'll go out and do a financial audit, look at all their numbers. I just, we just, I just asked a doctor to pay for my travel. I'm not trying to rip them off. It's like, let me just get in and see what's going on. Look at the, I'll spend five hours with you. We'll go over all the data, look at all your numbers, give you a report. And then from that, if you're interested, then we'll say, okay, if you want to work with Deb, my partner for 19 years, uh, and Kevin, uh, they'll actually, we'll schedule about 60 days where we're collecting pre-work, more data, blueprinting, calls with the doctor and the team prior before we come out, so we just don't show up. Hi, we're here doing a seminar. <laughs> you know, Seminars are informational, personal development and coaching is transformational. So it's not, oh, I heard a lecture for an hour, good luck, see ya. So we spend, Deb and Kevin spend four days that first time with the practice. First day, production, SWOT analysis, all day there, not to judge it, but just, hey, see what's going on, see the, how the skills are, see how the appointment schedule, what are they saying, how are they bringing in patients, what's going on with your insurance, what's happening with the doctor's case presentation, how's he bringing in patients, what's the hygienist doing, how, the, how are they treating the patients, what's the hand, all that, and then, the second and third day, we actually shut the practice down. We do a mini retreat. That's the hardest thing for the doctor to shut the practice down for two days. But we say, you, we, there's a saying, retreat to advance. It's just like here, come to a retreat that Howard's doing, Townie, for two or three days. Retreat, take a break so you can go back recharged, refired up. And so we, we, we work with just that one team for two days. And when you're focused with one team and you're working together, you can get a lot done and then the fourth day implementation, execution, and then follow up. So it's cool and you know, you, you don't get buy-in unless the team trusts you. And after spending four days with a team, they start to see, wow, these guys are authentic, there's integrity, they have new ideas. Remember Walt Disney said, it's not your intellect, it's the ideas and the imagination of what you can do that's gonna bring things forward. It's not like we have all this great knowledge, we have a lot of knowledge, but it's like, here's some new ideas, new information uh you know we've been in hundreds of practices so every time deb and kevin leave a practice i always ask that hey what did you learn from that practice because there's always one or two systems there they're doing it like that is awesome let's bring that into another practice and help somebody else and uh 
So, uh, you know, my partner, Deb, is no, she's not so young. So, see, that's man. another thing about consultants. You just know your practice. They're, they know multiple practices every year, and they're learning. It's almost yeah, like machine learning. learning. Exactly. It's like now there's so many programs that just machine learn. They say, okay, you're looking at accounting software. Let's machine learn 20 different systems, and that alone teaches you stuff. So, uh, I, I want to say this is... Um, this question is jaded because these are offices <clears throat> that are already reaching out for help wanting data consultants. They're already a league ahead. Yeah. But when you go into that intro office, the most important thing is HR. What percent of these practices in your evaluation do you say, okay, we, we have a, a toxic employee that has to go or they already passed that level. Well, when, when you've been doing this for years, what percent of the team is good to go? We can yeah. base out with this person and train them and keep them versus yeah. you get there and say, holy moly, this Amy Lou has got to go. Yeah, it's, a, it's such an interesting question because last week, Deb and Kevin were in practice in Florida with a younger woman, Dennis. And literally a week later, the doctor emailed us from the training and they loved it. They emailed, hey, our front office just gave our resi her resignation. Thanks. It's like, we think we were blaming you for it, but they were just kidding. But it was like we it was it was like wow you know we didn't expect that you know and, and when I did my audits for my father in law I used to spend the whole day in the practice and I would interview every person there for about forty five minutes in a in a closed door and after about five years of doing that I remember I'm, I was so burnt out I was exhausted when I left the practice because they would get behind closed doors and they'd be ragging on the front office people the high dentist would be upset with the doctor the doctor would be upset all these internal things and I'm like I'm not a psychologist here <laughs> you know I'm just trying to get things to improve and I and I, I after all that after 20 years I said I don't know like a doctor will come and Mark I don't know about this person you're gonna come out to my practice I don't know if she's the right I said you know I don't know either but we're gonna find out in the next 90 120 days and usually when Deb comes out and Kevin within that six month period the people that are committed and want that practice to do well they're going to stay and the ones that don't like this one last week they'll leave and they don't want to buy into the new culture the new direction but the what would you going. say the average size of the average office was and then in that three to six months how many would leave would you say the average office you work with had five people including the dentist? Uh, the average practice we work with has between five to twelve staff and I'd say plus plus the doctor, yeah, including the doctor. Including doctor. Okay, Five, so yeah. and is it usually one doctor practice? Yeah, one doctor or two doctors. Yeah. Okay, one or two doctors. Yeah. Is it majority one, sometimes two, or half and half? I'd say most are one. About two year are partnerships. Uh, we we're going out the one. So eighty percent are yeah. one. Yeah, we're going out to Minnesota next month, and there's three doctors. Okay, yeah. so but eighty percent were one doctor. Yeah. yeah. And those one doctors on average would have trains. Four to eight staff. Four to eight staff, and after yeah. they do your program, that four to eight staff, how many time? How many employees would usually jump ship? They weren't the right. Usually, staff. maybe just one. So there's one in every office. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes they stay, but usually one or two at the max. Okay, so 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 this is again the people who use consultants are a league of bed. They they've already gone through so many journeys, and now they're on this self improvement, and even those guys one member is still not right on the team we're at the off season now in the nfl and the draft is next week look how important the draft is in, sure, in football exactly. and everybody's trying to get that special player and yeah. i've been saying for 30 years that every business i don't care if you only have five people in the bit hr is everything you know having the right amazing, people on the bus like this guy from uh, dr sanchez who start with why the simon cynics book you know um but we just learned a lot from his call this morning. So in our retreat in, in May, we're going to spend three days with the why stuff. And he said that why stuff has totally changed his culture with this team because now he knows the why of every person in his office. Every team member's got a different why. And he said, when you understand their why and what motivates them, then you can you can you can have a phenomenal team. And so we're going to start looking at that, integrating that into our work because the why into your brand and the why is what you do and what is your why. It, you people say like he dr sandra is saying everybody wants to know what their passion is well if you until you understand what your why is you're not going to find your passion you're going to be all over the map and so it, it's really fascinating the work and uh and especially today because you know it's it's definitely a lot harder to run a, a, a dental business than it was in the 70s i mean i'm not saying it wasn't hard that then but with insurance 
continue to, to take away profit you know dmos like you the dso's like you talked about yesterday whether they stay or not but there's a lot more competition and i think it's good i think it's healthy that the doctors are more serious like when we work with them we're probably their third or fourth consultant you know and they're like well how some of them are like oh gosh how come? They're, they're kind of beating themselves up how come i haven't figured it out yet no it's like I don't, we're like after you work with growth and the greatness if you work with us keep looking keep bringing in other people bring in other people that know more than you you know and keep growing learning yeah. but back to the dental kindergarten you, you mentioned that your father-in-law first thing he did is lay down three books right go go through the learning lessons of those three books the first one was the e-myth well, well you know the e-myth and I some I mean, it's it's interesting a lot of people still haven't read that book yet but well they're young they're, they're yeah. under 30 so the e-myth talks about there's three when you start a business, you're, you're three people. You you have to be three people to run a bit. You're the entrepreneur who's a visionary, the manager who lives in the past, he's data and numbers, and then the technician who lives in the present, like what's on the books today, what do I need to do? So when you start a business, you don't realize why I need to be all three of those, and most of the time you're only one. And Gerber's always said, you know, the most successful practices take time to work on them instead of in them. That was this whole thing, but the technician is so busy doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. That's why it's like, why isn't there three or 400 dentists here? Five, 600, a thousand. I, oh, I can't take time out. Well, yeah, you need to learn, be around other people. Like I always tell my kids, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You know, if you're hanging around with the, you know, some people smoking pot and you know, that's your future, if that's okay with you, okay, cool. But retreat to advance, get around people who know more, and uh, continue to grow. So I don't know what the question was. I just lost track of the, the, the summarizing the myth. <laughs> oh, so yeah, work harder on the business than you do in it. So you have to, if you're going to really take and embrace that philosophy, then you have to have many retreats. With I heard uh, somebody said today that they, oh yeah, Dr. Sanchez said I for two years I took a half a day every month in team meetings. A half a day he worked with his team for two years on getting better. I, I, most dentists won't even take an hour a month and because it's either bitch sessions, they're complaining, they're whining, or what do I talk about? What do we work on? And even like a new book, when we when we introduce new books to the practice, I know that the team's not gonna read all those books. In fact, I, I tell the doctor, don't buy this book for all your team members, don't spend $150 on, just buy one and then have each person read one chapter, and then that person who reads a chapter, they debrief it for five minutes, and then the next person reads a chapter. So everybody's community learning. Everybody's trying to get better. Everybody's trying to improve. You know, I think Kevin talked about that in your meeting about, you know, it's a team-centered practice. Now, it used to be doctor-centered, you know, yes, doctor in the 70s, and that moved from a business-centered model with corporations, it's all about the business, and it moved to a patient-centered practice model where it's all about the patient which sounds great and now but now our focus is team team centered practice if your team is doing well they're happy they're healthy they're understanding emotional intelligence they're understanding how to work that then the patients get healthy you know so the team like you know if you've got a great team your life is pretty nice you know if you've got a great wife and you're working together your team, you know it's not perfect you know and look at my failures my business is 31 years old but my five key management team people all been there 20. So 10 years I was chasing the FAGD, the MAGD, the Diplomat International Con, and I, and I, and I, I was learning the technical side. Right. But it took about 10 years before I realized, my God, it, it, it's just all, who's the people on the bus? And I had this one character flaw that my dad had too, that no matter what this person had done no matter how many times he'd fall down live under a bridge in a box you, keep you always saw the best side of him and yeah. just want to oh i can fix you i can yeah, yeah, change yeah. you i can inspire you <laughs> yeah, and it took yeah, 10 yeah. years of, of sticking your tongue in a light socket before you thought maybe, maybe that person should be responsible for their success yeah, yeah. and and because i would like try to motivate him and i'd like yeah. well well maybe if i took my crew my team on a cruise <laughs> yeah. they'd all like each other now right. they don't like each other because there's three toxic <laughs> people right. in there right. and they're batshit crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. and so i spent 10 years trying to yeah. fix team members before i realized i'm going to get people that are already fixed yeah. i'm not going to i'm not going to try i'm why should i motivate you when it's easier if i hire an internally motivated person they're motivated 
if I find an internally person who's not motivated, I can't motivate you with bonuses and cruises. Right. Just like just like happiness. I, I can't make you happy. Yeah. Happiness is an inside job. So my dad spent his whole life yeah. trying to motivate unmotivated people. And it took me 10 years to realize, no, my dad's a great guy. He's a great, fun guy, but it's a, the yeah. only thing that really works yeah. is to find an internally motivated person and inter someone who yeah. they're why they're, they're into yeah. it. You know, one book that I read two years ago was love does by Bob Goff. It's not like a business book, but the first quote in the book, really helped my wife and I in our marriage. We've been married 25 years and you know, you have ups and downs like anything. But uh, the first thing he says is I've long, is this changed his life? He said, I've long stopped trying to fix people. I just want to be with them now. And my wife and I talked about that because you know, we tried to fix each other, you know, and it's like same with a doctor trying to, as you just said, trying to fix, it doesn't work. And, uh, now as a leader, like Maxwell talks about as his book, you're, the leader's job is to paint a picture of the vision that maybe is not, that the people would go, wouldn't go on their own. A leader is to, to be the influencer, the inspirer. And we don't come in and try to take that role. We want to empower the team to be their own leaders. Like the book Advantage by uh, Patrick Lencioni, it's a big book now, and he's written a lot of books. My partner, Deb, got certified in the training. His whole thing in organization, it's all organizational health. And he said, the key is peer-to-peer -peer accountability. That's where you get the most results. That when the peer, when your team is accountable to each other, not to you, the doctor, they're accountable to each other, and that's how you get the best. You know, well, you know that's how the military does it in a strange oh, way because they're life and death. So let's say Buster messes up, the 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 your general isn't going to punish Buster. He punishes the other seven guys. Oh, Buster decided to sleep in. <laughs> or he didn't come home on time. Right. So you other seven all do a hundred push-ups, <laughs> exactly, and then glow clean the toilets. Right, right, exactly. So now I don't, I don't yeah. have to say anything to Buster. And his when you seven get, best friends on in his in his, I'll squad. give you a perfect example of peer-to-peer -peer accountability from Dr. Peter Fay, a, a great prosthodontist and friend of mine in Maui. It's good to have friends in Maui, by the way. <laughs> and he's got a house that has a. If you ever want to visit him, he's got a he's got a uh, like a, another house next to him that you can stay with. This is Dr. Peter Fay. Yeah, you need to definitely get him on a podcast. Awesome guy um but he when he started he had uh doing about a million two back 20 years ago which was pretty good back then he had nine women nine team members and after four years he went from nine staff to eight seven six five four three three women doing the same 1.2 as nine were and he didn't fire him they left because of babies, transferred. But every time, now listen to this, this would never happen. Every time a woman left, a team member left, he'd get them together in, in a morning huddle, bring in breakfast and say, look, we lost Sally. She was doing these eight things, eight systems. I can hire another woman to take over. Or you guys know what the staff percentage is. It's 24% labor. Do you guys want to stay within that? Because if I hire another person, it's going to go up. But if you take over a role, guess what? I can share that percentage with you that are left. And guess what all those women did? They always said, we'll take it on. And so now those three women, do you think they'll ever leave him? No, they're working three days a week doing the same production, just as profitable. So that's so what, what, do you, what do you think they're making each, each of those? I don't know. I, I But I think organizational efficiency, and one of the things that you read in my in, about the seven things, strategies, time, now we shifted from time. Now it's all about energy management. It's like you and I, I'm 58. You know, it's, you just don't have the energy. Like to try to lose 10 pounds, I'm trying to lose like 15 more pounds. I'm freaking killing myself. You know, it's just like, but it's all about a team. It's all about energy now. See, it's all about attitude. I'm committed yeah. to obesity. <laughs> I'm committed. <laughs> I'm and committed. They will say, are you going to join the gym and lose some weight? No, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the pill. I really think any day now, they're, they're going to come the out. pill. I already have the operation. And I'm going to get my know, six pack so. back. But uh, anyway, but it's all about energy management. And when you get your team focused on the flywheel and everybody working together, energy, then people say, well, how can you work seven to two and be done and be more profitable? Everybody's focused. Everybody's bringing good energy, good attitude, whatever. You know, it's it's well, it was um, I've seen so much data. Rick Kirshner, who has 300 comfort dentals, was the first guy that was showing me clear data. Yeah. 30 years ago that when a dentist works four six hour shifts they hit each one of those shifts ready to go they bust it out for mm -hmm. six hours four days a week 
But when you sit there and say, no, not six hour shifts, but let's say five, eight hour days. Yep. Well, if, if I have to go run a hundred yards, I can sprint. But if you say I got to do a marathon, I'm just going to take off slow. Yeah. And he said they spend the same amount of energy. Exactly. But when you have an office for to double your availability, when he has a six hour shift, if you come in and work uh, six to two, yeah, or six to um, six to noon, yeah, and then your partner comes and works noon to six with his own staff. But anyway, he, he was showing yeah, that different ways. four six yeah. hour days they actually produced more. more exactly. And by the time you have to work, and in fact, he was laughing. By the time you have to work five and a half days a week, I mean you're just you're walking to work with a walker. Yeah, and everything is so slow. Yeah, because you're pacing yourself. He just, like he just had a consultant here. I listened to this morning. Great lady, Heidi Mount. Heidi Mount is awesome. Yeah, and, and that was only her second lecture. Yeah, and she. she I hope they she, taped she, it. Did they tape it? it? She, she did a great job, and she her whole thing is I can I can get five hundred dollars a day more in profitability in your practice. So looking at your schedule. Because she had one doctor, she said, called her one time. He was freaking, I got to move my practice because they want double the rent. And so she'll, she'll hold on a second. I got to be out by Monday. Well, don't you have patient schedule? Yeah, but I can't afford double the rent. Well, she looked at his schedule and she said, hold on here. I, I can get, I can definitely get more out of this schedule. And that day they did $4,600 more. <laughs> You know, and it's just like, I guess I can stay here. I can afford it, you know. So there's always, you know, a better way, like Pete Dawson's new book. There's always a better way. I mean, Dino wrote that 30 years ago. How's Pete way. doing? Uh, actually, actually, Kevin Kowishan was with them at the Dawson Institute teaching a couple months ago, and he gave them the book. It just came out. Yeah. And, you know, he's had his health problems. He's 90 or something. But, I mean. But his wife just passed away. Yes. Re, uh, yes. That's, uh, that's yeah, so That's hard. a hard one. Yeah. Uh, but his new book, I would that's a great book, his story. And I didn't know this, but he he claims in his book that he he started block scheduling. <laughs> he invented that. And he was so systematic. Peter Dawson? Yeah, and Peter Dawson had what, what, he, his new book? Yeah. What's his new book? It's called A Better Way. A, a better, better way. way, yeah. And when did it come out? Like three months ago. Great oh, book. Well, I have it at my booth if you want no, to look at it. No, email Peter and tell him to come back on the yeah. uh, show. He was one of the most viewed podcasts I did, I think. I mean, yeah. I'm on youtube i mean I, oh, I, yeah. then thank you for subscribing on the youtube channel we just passed ten thousand subscribers um i love reading the comments on the deal it gives a lot of feedback um but um it was a good read it was great reading his book because he says in his book he he says i had a systems analyst come in to look at every single system technically and business wise to improve it even if it was one percent like kaizen it even one percent improvement doesn't matter but he said i didn't do this on my own you know i found people who were smarter than me to help me run my business better and get it more efficient and so peter dawson's uh, new book is a better way yeah i have a picture of i have a book i have his book on my is desk on, want to take a picture of yes yep um, if you put peter dawson dr peter uh, a better one i think it's a better it's not it may be a better way or a better way to live or something okay. like that yeah um so i want to go back to peter fay yeah he um, he works with case presentation. Yeah, he taught at Panky for many years. But how yeah. do you? But I know my homies. They, they, they'll tell you I don't like to sell. I didn't yeah. go to I didn't go to eight years of school to be a salesman, <laughs> and they don't even want to hear about case presentation because they 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 don't Co like to discovery sell. treatment. Yeah, so so what what is, what well, is, you know what's what is funny Peter about Fay? that? And, have, I, and tell Peter Fay I want to podcast yeah, him about this, but but what, what what is he telling these people about case? Well, presentation? It, you know he goes through he's videotaped all his consults for over twenty years. He had a camera. Hidden cameras? Yeah. Oh, he told patients. They were, he, you know, he said, can I... I did not tell the I patients. videotaped, you know, I, he just thought, but I, was honest, I videotaped because I'm going to go back and review this and I want to make sure I get this right for you. So patients, you know, he only yeah. had a few that said no, but most... Well, they but, do it on all the phone calls. This call may know, be recorded for training purposes. I guess like two things, a couple things, I guess, so I'll go back to Peter Faye. I, I remember looking up the word sell in the dictionary one time and I was kind of shocked at the definition. You know, when it, if you ever look up the word selling, it says to speak your core values. And I tell Dennis and I said, don't be so worked up about selling dentistry. If you believe in what you're doing, share your core values and, and tell people what you do. I mean, it's good, you know? So don't think of it as I gotta sell, 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 sell. You know, it's share your core values and beliefs. And Peter Fay and Doug Sanquist and Paul Falvey, they've all gone through all the hardships of learning how to sit down and talk about, you know, and then you talk about money. Well, Peter always said, I'm not gonna defer money to my uh, assistant or 
I'm, I'm going to talk money. I want to get, I want to look the patient in the eye and say, it's going to be 18,000. How do you feel about that? Do you have a budget? What can I do to help you? And if he wants to be the one to discuss money, because in the beginning he was afraid to talk about big cases and money and it's very intimidating. And now he's finally comfortable. It took him a long time, but you know, presenting cases and talking about the money. I mean, that's part of the work we do and sitting down with patients. It's all, you know, everybody, you know, it, it's well, it's yeah. so ridiculous that the average American between 16 and 76 will buy 13 new cars <laughs> and the median average price of a new car in 2018, according to USA Today and the Blue Book value thing is $33,000. Yeah. And 95% of all dentists will go their entire career without presenting one $33,000 case, which means that the yeah. dentist believes it's more important for you to have a new Toyota every five years your whole life yeah, yeah. than to have an yeah. amazingly fixed up teeth. Yeah. And then you look at that age, at age 64 in America, 10% have zero teeth. Yeah. And an, another 10% are missing more than half. And then at 74, 20% have no teeth times two, another 20% missing half. Yeah. And the dentists are like, oh yeah, well, we're all good with that. Cause yeah. they all got a new Toyota every five years from age 16 to 76. Yeah. And it's like, dude, that's your values <laughs> coming through. I mean, I yeah. think the engineers should be clapping about the cars, not the dentists. I mean, yeah, I mean it's all the dentist it's... can't sit there and aim a goal said, I'd rather at 60, I'd rather at 74, you had all your teeth and maybe you only got a new car yeah. instead of every five years, instead of 13 new cars. Yeah. Maybe you only got 10. Like I got a lot of money. My car's at 2004 yeah. and it's 2019. So how come I have yeah. a 16 year old car? Cause I value a lot of stuff. Every time I take my car into Lexus, they say, well, you know, if you gave me your car and a check for 98 grand, you'd walk out with a new car. And I say, well, that's true. But I'm thinking of all the things I'd rather do with 98 grand right. than upgrade a perfectly functional yeah. SUV 450 right. that goes anywhere I want. I mean, well, when you were when you had I, Dr. I Kevin Kawishan on your podcast, as I've been watching it because I have a loop in here. Uh, Kevin was talking about that patients don't know what health is because the doctor never explain them what a truly healthy mouth is. And unless you actually show this is what your mouth could be a vision of a healthy mouth and they can't even move towards that. And uh, I remember one doctor in Vegas, uh, Jeff, who came to our treatment planning and uh, he would only spend 15 minutes with a patient. That's kind of the typical fit. And what do you, what do you see? Uh, billing statement codes and they get a statement, they walk out, there's no, what, what's the purpose? What's the why behind it? What's, where's the, like my father-in-law, the first question he always asks a patient is, how long do you want to keep your teeth? And I remember him asking me that and I kind of laugh. Well, of course the rest of my life, you know, it's like, he goes, well, what, what's your plan, Mark? And I'm like, what do you mean a plan? He goes, well, has any dentist put a plan together to keep your teeth the rest of your, your life? And I said, no, I've had five dentists. He goes, well, do you want a plan? And he goes, cause I know this is the key. I said, he, I know you want no dentistry. I'm like, I don't. And he said, I know you don't want to pay me either. You don't want to come see me. And I'm like, you're right. And he goes, well, would you want a plan that you can save a lot of money and only see me a few times? I'm like, sounds good to me, but no, there, nobody put a plan together for me. And it's just like today, Kevin's going to present that. Dr. Gwishan's going to present that, a health-centered plan. And when doctors come to our retreat, they learn about putting a, a long-term, a health plan together. And one doctor in Vegas came to our retreat. I remember a week later, he called me, he goes, Mark, he goes, I had a patient, a woman like 58. She needed 19,000. I've never presented a treatment plan for 19,000. And I, I spent like an hour with her. I went over everything and she went to the front. I didn't know what happened. A hour later, my my front office manager came back. Hey, we got a check for 19,000. And he texted me the check. He goes, he's been practicing for seven years. Never had a case like that. And I'm like, it's about, it's not, even, it's not even about the money. It's about, hey, now you're gonna get that woman healthy. That's a good thing. And what you I don't know? understand is when you talk to a woman and say, what would you think if you woke up tomorrow and all your teeth fell out? I mean, they're like, I'm like, well, what would your day be like? And they go, I, I would cry, I wouldn't go to work. I'd, I, I'd be sick to my stomach and I'd say, yeah. and then I say, well, what if you woke up tomorrow and all your teeth fell out and all your hair fell out? You're as bold <laughs> with me with no teeth. And at that yeah. point, almost all women choose suicide. They go, if I woke up and had your hair <laughs> with no teeth, no, I would. I, I, I would. Yeah. So, so it's like, okay, so if all the women say, 
if they woke up tomorrow and all their teeth saw out, it'd be a nightmare beyond comprehension and they would cry and cry sure, and be sick. Exactly. And if their hair fell out with their teeth, they'd kill themselves. <laughs> then how come all the people in your small town in Oklahoma all are have bought three or four new F one fifty trucks their lifetime and and right. and ten percent will have yeah. no teeth at sixty four, twenty yeah. percent will have no teeth at seventy four, times two missing have how, how, where's the big disconnect? I think yeah. it's on the dentist side. Oh yeah, like I Peter think Faye, it's the dentist. I don't want to steal Peter Faye's story, but yeah, yeah, you'd probably tell you this, but I remember a couple years ago we had a patient it was 74 woman and she needed about 35 to 40,000 she her mouth is a, he calls them train wrecks he works on train wrecks and she needed 35 40,000 she she said I'm 74 I'm not going to live that long you know and you've heard this before and Peter's like well that's true you you may not live that much longer and uh, you don't know what's going on when they're 74 like do the, uh, do the kids want that money and they're gonna tell their mo their grandmother or mother, you don't need 30 I, that money's my my inheritance you know don't spend it with the doc and peter said well you could live to your 90 95 you could she came back the second week and he said to her look i know this is a lot of money but let me ask you he goes let me ask you a question he said what if you get all this dentistry done you spend thirty eight thousand with me you give me the check a week later you write me a beautiful car oh, i love my mouth i'm chewing better now i love my food i'm able to kiss you know whatever I'm, i just feel so good about myself and then he says to her and then but a week later you die are you going to care that you spent thirty eight thousand dollars with me and she looked at him she said you're right i'm not Let's go ahead and do the dentistry. I mean, sometimes you just got to say something crazy. We you know, live in Arizona. <laughs> there are 50 states. We have the only state where the mis most common broken bone is different than the other states. Are you aware of this? Most common broken bone? No, I'm not. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really go back and show you that I know what I'm talking about. It was an actually, it was an orthopedic surgeon in um, New Mexico that when they laid out all the neanderthal cro-magnum peaking man you know you only have so many complete fossils there were a lot of fractures and a lot of people didn't know what all those fractures were from and an orthopedic surgeon in new mexico is the one who informed the world he goes my gosh i looked at the ratio of broken bones those are rodeo clowns yeah. And that was the first insight where it was a perfect fingerprint match of the clavicles, the zygomatic arch, the whole nine yards. And those were men that were um, around bulls during bull riding in a rodeo. And that's when people realized that um, caveman wasn't throwing a spear and dropping a wildebeest. They were running that thing with a spear. They were holding onto that spear and they were getting kicked in the face. Oh, yeah. It was a kicking big bull. And that fracture rate was the same. And so they have, orthopedic surgeons have the fracture rates of what bones should all be broken. And you're saying, what does that have to do with what he's saying? The number one broken bone in Arizona, unlike the other 49 states, is a rib because all these people retire down to Arizona because of the climate and they're having sex at 70, 80, <laughs> 90 years old. And mama's grandma's rib <laughs> is more likely to break than anything else because- so, How would I know it come to sex in your this talk? Well, what are the three main things? <laughs> Eating, drinking, <laughs> reproduce, and offspring. So just, so, but yeah. the, the reason I wanna get back to it is because when I got out of dental kindergarten at 25, my biggest diagnostic treatment planning error of my entire career was, well, I'm not going to tell an 85 year old man he needs to do all this because he's going to be dead next week. Yeah. Well, five years later, he wasn't dead. And I really messed up on one guy because he had um, he had these broken down teeth and he had gum disease and he had all this stuff going on. But he was like 92. And I just thought. Well, I'm just going to get my antibiotics or a mouth rinse or something like that. And, and then like a year later, it got really infected. Then it was like endo and surgery. He didn't, I think he lived to be 99 and I was ready to not do treatment on him at 91. Yeah. And it took you to like 92 and it got a lot worse. Yeah. And then we did all this treatment and then he lived seven more years after that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we just had, the, know. we just yeah. had Guinness's registered the longest living person alive today. She just got registered a week ago or something. I forgot how old she was. She was like 114 or 117. So, yeah. so when you're telling 75, 75 is the new young. So um, they have yeah. the money and they buy new cars. They buy a new Buick. They buy a new car. It's a just new like truck. Bob Barkley said, you know, my patients might not accept for my treatment plan for five years. 
you know, you present it and you just, you, you present a full plan and, it, it, and you, like my father once said, you can go as fast as you want with this market. You want to do it over three years, four years, one year, six months, I'll work with you. And so, you, but you present the vision, you give people the hope, people need hope of what's possible. And uh, I was just thinking about, because I don't want to probably run out of time, but I, I have on my website, I have it at my desk at the booth here. It's like, I love John Wooden stuff and um, his books. And John, John Wooden, Wooden the, yeah. the basketball coach. Yeah, awesome guy, awesome books. What, what school was he, basketball? UCLA. And, uh, but one of his quotes. Oh, UCLA, anybody can get in that school. You just gotta, <laughs> yeah, he's got to pay people. Find a broker. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A broker to get you. Broker. But uh, one, of his, one of his quotes, two of them are, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts and that's just a humbling quote I, i've told i say the quote again it's what you learn after you know it all that counts and that's a very humbling quote because we don't know everything we're never going to know everything nobody is no man is an island like john dunn says the poet and uh, the other thing is he said is each day is a masterpiece and it's it is it's a gift each day is a gift and uh jim Rohn, my mentor always said the last thing on the seven principles on my website, he, those are from Jim Rohn, and Jim Rohn said, hey, pursue, be thankful for what you have while pursuing all that you want. So if you're not thankful and grateful, then if you get more in life, it's not gonna be better. I don't even wanna tell you about my cars and my house with my two kids and my wife, the cars we've gone through. It doesn't make you any happier. You know, I told my wife after 13 years, we she wanted another diamond. I know this may be personal, but it's just like, I got her one. And then a week later, we're in a fight. And I said to her, you know what, honey? Diamonds don't keep you together. You know, relationships do, intimacy does, getting deeper, not trying to fix each other. Same with a team, but let's, you know, when I was young, growing up, I didn't, I never thought about this, but my family's got, all families are dysfunctional, including mine. Every team is dysfunctional. It's like Scott Peck says in the road less travel. Life is difficult. Once you accept that, you can move forward. It's like we're all we're all in this the game together. Let's all try to be the best we can. Let's all support, encourage each other, try to get better. And but it's usually gonna take one person to step out and say, let's try to improve. And hopefully it's the doctor. Sometimes it could be a team member. I've been many team members that say, you know what, the doctor is just not motivated. And it's just like, well, maybe he just maybe you can, you know, maybe he just needs a little like the book Halftime by Bob Buford or Game Plan, moving from success to significance. The second half of your life, he says, can be better than the first half. That gives us hope to us. But he but most people think the second half's gonna suck, you know. But he said the second half can be better. Hopefully you have deeper relationships. You you learn you you let things go, you surrender more. You're not as pissed off driving on the road when someone cuts you off. You know, you just learn to let go. And uh that's the great thing about a dental team because my father in law always called it. You have a little dojo and you can, you, sp you spend more time with those people than you do with your family. And why not tr try to create the best relationships you can? And, you know, my father always said, where can you go to work and build relationships, see people's kids, make good money, have a great life? And, uh, you know, there's not many jobs, vocations that you can do that, where you can build relationships. And I think a lot of times dentists forget, you know, what's your higher purpose in your work? What's your higher calling? It's not just fixing teeth. You know, I will always have to remind the dentist and the, and, the, and the team, like, you're just not answering calls. When that person comes in, you don't know what that person's going, she might've just had a car wreck, lost a daughter, got a divorce, and you just touch them, say, hey, thanks for coming today, you know? And they're like, Oh, they, you know, they, you just don't know. And it's like, you're, 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 you're touching people's lives every day. What a beautiful gift you get every day. It's hard work. Yeah. But it's good work. Awesome work that you do. And it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, I'm just blessed because my father-in-law was a dentist and I got into this by, by marrying his daughter, you know, and, uh, if, I, if someone had said when I was 16 or 18 years old, oh, Mark, your best friends in life are going to be dentists, I would say, what are you mind, you know? But it's just like, what? dentists are great people. They're very. I love dentists. Yeah. My, my boys are always yeah. telling me that they say, Dad, all your friends, yeah. they're so nice. They're yeah. so fun. Yeah. Well, to be a dentist, you got to read a lot of books and a lot of different they're always well read they're always yeah. smart they're they're a great group yeah. of guys yeah. and i just want to end on this is um you know if you go on shark tank and you start talking about your exit strategy mark cuban's out mark cuban doesn't know why he should invest in this company when you already want to get out 
And we were talking on another podcast that, you know, some of the greatest legends in dentistry, Bob Ibsen, who owned Denmat and started Rembrandt Toothpaste. He, he died at the chair in his 80s. Jim Glidewell is 70 years old. He has, you know, he still is, has 10, 20 year plans with Glidewell. Um, and then I meet dentists all the time that are 40 or 50 and they're burned out, they're fried, they're packing away money in their 401k and they're already telling on dental town and their signature how many years they go till they <laughs> retire. It's like, well, why don't you sit there and instead of sitting there having, wanting to retire by instead of 65, your goal is to get out by 55. Why don't you figure out why you want to get out? Why don't you fix that? And my my mentor that made me want to be a dentist, my next door neighbor, he's Kenny Anderson. He's He's been practicing 50 years. And that's yeah. probably why yeah. he gave me the fever. I mean, half a century later, he's still doing it in Wichita, Kansas. And um, so if you're burned out, you're fried, you don't like it. And then I say, well, why don't you get a, a someone who's just like a life personal business coach in dentistry and their whole career, all they do is fix that. And you go, no, that's fluff. That's, I, I need to learn bone grafting or I need to find that the next amazon.com stock and, and buy a thousand shares and get lucky. Like, like, like really that's your exit strategy to, to win the lottery in the stock market or, or whatever, whatever. Just, you know, get your house Someone in order. said this and my father-in-law, we said it, the biggest investment in your practice is not the new waterfall not the bigger building it's your people invest in your people change your life you know your biggest asset your biggest is your people grow your people grow your life and the biggest that's the big and it's the don't invest in the stock market i'm not saying not do that or real estate but if you invest in your own business and make it the best you'll make more than the stock market probably or real estate and you know it's gonna like you said yesterday it, there's gonna be another hit so hopefully you got your practice solid, like my father-in-law called it, recession-proofing your business so that when it does hit again, you, you're, you're able to maintain, at least survive and pay your people and you, you've got good relationships and it's gonna, you're gonna be okay. You know, in the golden years, 55 to 70, I met a doctor here, he's 65, and I go, ah, that was with the golden years. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, that's when everybody trusts you so much that you know, they just say yes, because they, they, you've been around so long and treatment plans have been around. They say, I'm ready, doc. I trust you. Let's go ahead. You know, but most dentists like you said, they want to get out when they're 40 or 50 because they're burned out. It's like if they would just get this piece, they were like, this is awesome. This is great. And nothing's perfect, but it can be a great life and practice, as, as you, know, you know. And I've met two practicing dentists so far that were 92. One was George Rui in St. Joe, Missouri, practiced at 92 years old. Loved it. <laughs> and in LA met a dentist who uh, survived Auschwitz Jeez. in Poland um, and at wow. 92 years old guess what um, he's at my seminar and guess what he was all excited about he had just bought a CBCT <laughs> and was just got into placing implants isn't that amazing when you meet people and like that and he was so excited I'm yeah, like yeah, yeah. oh my god you survived Auschwitz yeah and now you're 92 and you got a CBCT and he thinks that CBCT was the coolest thing ever yeah. and yeah. he was so excited and I'm like man is life an attitude or what yeah hey, like, yeah yeah. Thank you so oh, much thank you. for coming on. Awesome. You were going to say one last thing? Well, I, you, you just reminded me of Joseph Campbell's work, The Hero's Journey, and he said uh, he inspired people, inspires others. And like that at 92, you like walk away like, grief, God, that, that just inspiring, you know? And that's hopefully that's kind of our, our work to keep inspiring. So a 92-year-old that survives Auschwitz still loves dentistry, but you're 45 and you're burned <laughs> out and want to quit. And it's not you. It's not you. And there's nobody that can fix it. Yeah, this, this is a ghost. So how do they contact you? Um, they can just email me at mark at greatnessinstitute.com or go to the website or just call me. I, my phone number is my cell is 541-301-0831. And yeah. Say it again one more time. 541-301-0831. Uh, Even though that's an Oregon area code, I live in uh, Arizona now. So. so it's mark at greatnessinstitute.com. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Great. And uh, send your other you. homies on the show yeah, to keep this going.